You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and you are listening to my show on bostonfreeradio.com or watching it on Somerville Community Access TV, that is SCAT-V, or you're watching me and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal channel or uh, Boston Free Radio's page. In any event, I'm glad you could join me whichever way you so choose. So I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. But first, I'm going to get into what's topping the box office, the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And I expected, actually, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to be number one at the box office again for the third week in a row. Turns out that actually didn't happen. But... If I, were to predict, if I were to predict that any movie would top Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, it would be Alien Covenant. And sure enough, Alien Covenant did just that. It made $36.2 million in the United States against a budget of $97 million. So it's not a hit yet here in the States, but it could be in a couple of weeks. However, internationally, Alien Covenant has so far made... $117.7 million, which makes it a tentative hit internationally. So good for Alien Covenant. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 fell to number two this week after two weeks at number one. It made $34.7 million this weekend in the United States. Just a couple million less than Alien Covenant, but it still made a lot more than Alien Covenant in its first weekend. And I think it's second weekend too, but don't quote me on that. But on a budget of $200 million, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has so far made $301.4 million in the United States so far. Around the world, in just three weeks, it has made $732.9 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit all around the world. And the next movie, which was number three at the box office and debuting at number three, is a movie I actually didn't expect to even make the top five, not because of its subject matter, but more because it seems like an independent movie, is the movie Everything, Everything. So it debuted at number three, made $11.7 million at the box office this weekend in the United States, and that's against a budget of $10 million. I don't have the international numbers for you yet, but... Already domestically, Everything Everything is automatically a tentative hit. And my guess is in in one week it'll be certified, but we'll have to wait and see. Snatched was number two at the box office last week when it debuted. This weekend, it's number four. It made $7.8 million this weekend. On a budget of $42 million, Snatched has so far made $33 million in the United States, and around the world it has made $39 million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but it's getting very close to being at least a tentative hit. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, is struggling even more at number five, falling from number three last week. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword only made $7.2 million and snatched outgrossed it again. On a budget of $175 million, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword has made in the United States only $27.5 million. It's doing better internationally, though, but still not enough to make it a hit of any kind. Around the world, it has so far made $94.5 million. So I do not... It looks like King Arthur Legend of the Sword is probably going to be considered a flop at this point because I don't see it recovering from this big a deficit. But again, maybe I'm wrong, but it's not looking good for King Arthur Legend of the Sword. Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, debuts at number six in the box office this weekend, having made $7.1 million domestically against a budget of $22 million. However, it, it is, I don't have the international numbers for you, but it's also not looking particularly good for Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul. But then again, it is in its first week. School hasn't gotten out for summer yet, so maybe it will recover, but so far it's looking kind of bleak for the long haul. Uh, 
The Fate of the Furious, however, is number seven at the box office this weekend, falling from number four last week. This weekend, The Fate of the Furious made $3.2 million, but against a budget of $250 million, The Fate of the Furious has so far made $219.9 million here in the States, and around the world it has made so far $1.21 billion. So The Fate of the Furious has not made all its money back here in the States, but I'm not sure if that matters to movie executives because it is most certainly a certified hit around the world and has been for a couple of weeks. The Boss Baby is also doing really well, although like The Fate of the Furious, it's making its descent after eight weeks at the box office. But The Boss Baby made $2.8 million at the box office this weekend in the United States. Against a budget of $125 million, The Boss Baby has so far made $166.2 million here in the States and $467.9 million around the world. So while it hasn't pulled in the same numbers as The Fate of the Furious, Unlike The Fate of the Furious, The Boss Baby is a tentative hit and is probably likely to stay that way in the United States. Around the world, though, it is a certified hit, so it far exceeded my expectations, i got to tell you that. Beauty and the Beast also took a fall. Last week it was number five after staying in the five, six level rank in the top ten over the last three weeks. This weekend, Beauty and the Beast made $2.5 million. Against a budget of $160 million, Beauty and the Beast has so far made $497.9 million just in the United States. Around the world, it has made $1.22 billion. So it took the fate of the furious six weeks to make as much money around the world as it took Beauty and the Beast. However, The Fate of the Furious is not a hit at all whereas, in the United States, whereas Beauty and the Beast is a certified hit here in the States. So I guess that goes to show you how moviegoers attend movies around the world as opposed to just in the United States. But then again, that's just my observation. And finally, at number 10, How to Be a Latin Lover, which is a movie that never, well, actually, it reached, it peaked at number two. It's unlikely to go up to the top five, but it made $2.1 million this weekend. Against a budget of $10 million, it has made $29.3 million here in the States and $44.3 million around the world. The first movie I'm going to review for you is going to be Alien Covenant. This is the, I think it's the sixth movie in the Alien franchise, if you include Alien vs. Predator, although not a lot of people do. If you don't count that, this is the fifth movie and the second prequel to the Alien franchise. So Alien Covenant comes before the events of 1979's classic movie Alien, but after the events in Prometheus. And a lot of people were really disappointed about or, or in the film Prometheus, mainly because they expected to see an Alien prequel, and they did. But the only connection between Prometheus and Alien was at the very, very end of the film. And I won't give that away, but I actually really liked Prometheus. As for Alien Covenant, I'll just say right away, it was a good movie with great actors in it and excellent special effects but in terms of the of its place in the alien franchise i'm still not sure exactly how it was necessary and i'll explain exactly how i feel about that but it is director ridley scott's third alien movie he directed the original alien from 1979 he directed prometheus from four years ago um, actually, I think it was three years ago. Yes, it was three years ago. And, of course, he directed this movie. So, Alien Covenant, what is it about? It is about a colony ship known as Covenant, and they got their biblical references a little mixed up there, but anyway. The crew of a colony ship, which is bound for a remote and habitable planet other than Earth, discover an uncharted paradise on their way to this remote planet with a threat beyond their imagination and must attempt a harrowing escape. So, as you can imagine, the threat beyond their imagination is, of course, these alien creatures. So, as I said before, the colony ship is called the Covenant, and the reason I say they had their, they had their 
biblical references a little mixed up there is because there is the Ark of the Covenant, which is actually just a box where the the tablets of the Ken the Ten Commandments take place. But I think that because this ship bears a resemblance to Noah's Ark, I I believe that either the screenwriters and or Ridley Scott probably mixed up the Ark with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark that Noah sailed was a ship. The Ark of the Covenant is basically a giant box that has stone tablets. But regardless... I, I think that could be overlooked because Covenant is still a really cool name. So anyway, the passengers on this ship include a robot by the name of Walter, who's played by Michael Fassbender. And you might remember that Michael Fassb- Fassbender also played a robot in Prometheus by the name of David. Well, David and Walter meet. And, and as a matter of fact, when this ship actually lands on this seemingly inhabitable planet... David is there to greet them. And you're wondering as, as the movie's progressing, well, y- you can definitely understand wh- how David could survive on this planet because he is a robot that looks like a human, not a human himself. But you're also wondering, is he, can he be trusted by this, this crew? Well, the, the members of the crew include the captain, Orem, who's played by Billy Crudup, and there are also some other notable actors in this, such as one of the members of the ship named Daniels, who's played by Catherine Waterston, in probably her breakout role. Catherine Waterston has been in a number of movies um, recently, including Inherent Vice from 2014, most recently in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, where she played one of the main characters. And she was also in uh, the movie Steve Jobs, which also starred Michael Fassbender, and was given a few Academy Award nominations, but was still an underrated movie and undeservedly bombed at the box office. Well, if you didn't see Steve Jobs or you didn't notice Katherine Waterston in that movie, you will notice her here. As a matter of fact, as I was watching this, I began to think that Katherine Waterston was probably being prepped to be the next Ripley. And if they ever do decide to make a sequel to Alien Covenant, which they might, depending on the performance of Alien Covenant at the box office, I am pretty sure that Katherine Waterston will be the star of that movie. And will Michael Fassbender come back? For me to give that away would probably give away the entire movie but there are certainly a fair number of plot twists there are some great special effects especially when it comes to the aliens and of course you see aliens pop out of people's chests and it's not exactly pleasant to watch but it makes good viewing if you're a sci-fi fan however as i was watching this i didn't exactly think that anything in this film would have i think given more, given well-needed originality to the Alien franchise. It almost felt like Alien Covenant was a mashup of Alien from 1979 and James Cameron's Aliens from 1986. It almost seemed like the screenwriters and vicariously the director almost wanted to make a mashup of both those films. But... As I was watching it, I, I was thinking to myself, Prometheus served a purpose in seeing how the aliens formed and what connection they had to the human race. But here, it just seems like an entirely different ship, not connected to Ripley from the other alien movies, came into play here. It was just another ship with human beings on it that lands on a seemingly inhabitable seemingly habitable planet and i just didn't really get any sort of connection or addition to the alien narrative in in other words all seven movies which include alien versus predator in in the grand scheme of things it it almost seemed just to be a remake of alien and for that reason i got to give alien covenant my recommend or rather my rating 
of a checkout because while the special effects were really good and while the acting, especially by Michael Fassbender and Catherine Waterston, was really good, I just didn't find the plot all that original and purposeful. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul. And this is the fourth Diary, Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie based on the books of the same name by Jeff Kinney, who also wrote the screenplay to this movie and a number of other films. I'm not sure if he wrote the screenplay to every Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie, but he certainly had some... He's, he certainly benefited greatly from, well, <laughs> his selling the rights to Diary of a Wimpy Kid in order to make a movie out of it. But from the research I'm gathering right now, he's credited with writing the book Diary of a Wimpy Kid, but in terms of the first Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie from 2010, he actually had no hand in writing the screenplay. Here, in this movie, he actually did co-write the screenplay with David Bowers, who also is directing this movie. I'm not sure if that's for the first time, but what is most notable about this Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie is that the cast from the first Wimpy Kid movies, the, the first three, from 2010, 2011, 2012, are not here. There's an all-new Wimpy Kid here because the original Wimpy Kid, the character named Greg Hefley, who was played in the first three movies by Zachary Gordon, is A, not a kid anymore, he's 19, and B, if you see recent pictures of him from this year or maybe last year, he's not wimpy anymore. He grew up to be a very good-looking kid. So the new wimpy kid in this movie is Jason Drucker. And Jason Drucker is... I, I, I thought I was going to see his age there, but no, his age isn't published. But I would guess he's probably 12 or 13. His character in this movie is supposed to be 12. And also, they didn't just replace this, uh, the, the original kid who played Greg Hefley. They replaced his whole family. In the original three movies, Greg's parents, Susan and Frank Hefley, were played by Rachel Harris and Steve Zahn, respectively. Here, they're replaced by Alicia Silverstone and Tom Everett Scott. Kind of getting some Generation Xers into the parent role, but that's entirely appropriate because a lot of Generation Xers are now parents. That's not the problem with this movie. The problem with this movie, in short, is that it sucks. What I really liked about the two out of the three Wimpy Kid movies that I saw was that it might not have been an exact mirror of my adolescence. Trust me, my adolescence was a lot more R-rated than the PG Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. But I liked the idea of a kid who's a misfit and who's an outcast in school, and he's trying to sort of find his way, and he's getting more adolescent feelings within him, and he's trying to deal with those. I get that. There is none of this in Diary of a Wimpy Kid the Long Haul. So the Hefley family is back, but they're planning a road trip to attend Meemaw, that is the Wimpy Kid's grandmother's 90th birthday party. But this trip goes hilariously off course thanks to Greg's newest scheme to get to a video game convention. So I say it's hilariously off course because I'm reading the tagline here. There's really not anything hilarious in this film. I admit that I did chuckle a few times. In fact, one of the ways I chuckled was when or one of the reasons I chuckled was there was one part where the parents are in the van and they're driving to their destination and they are trying to get the whole family involved in some family gathering time while they're driving. And so the parents turn on the Spice Girls song, Wannabe, and the kids are going, oh God, this song is so old, change it. Well, <laughs> it's kind of, I, as much as I cringed when I heard that, there are kids today who consider the Spice Girls song Wannabe old. It is 20 years old now, which makes me feel even older. So thanks a lot, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I really appreciate that. So that was one of the instances where I chuckled. But the rest of this movie made me feel so unclean. The reason for that is because there is there are so many gross-out jokes that the other three Wimpy Kid movies did not stoop to having in here. There, there are scenes where people are covered in mud. There's a scene involving an empty pool with, with rats around it. There's also 
a hot tub that the main characters step into, but I just felt incredibly unclean watching them bathe in this hot tub. And there are also jokes involving urine and feces and, and fart jokes here and there. Nothing in this movie is even the slightest bit realistic. And I, I know it's a comedy and it's a film comedy. It's not supposed to be realistic, but there was nothing in this movie even poignant. I could tell you some stories about the road trips I've had with my family growing up. And I can tell you that even one anecdote from any of these road trips would absolutely make this movie pale in comparison. It just absolutely insults its audience with its gross out humor. In fact, there's even one scene where this kid, Greg, is trying to find his baby brother in this large McDonald's-like playground complex. And he's trying to find his brother in a vat of plastic balls. And his, his hand is, is stuck to a diaper. So he starts to be trended as diaper boy or, or something, a du- diaper hand diaper hand and of course this creates a meme and it creates a viral video and i that's probably the most realistic part of the movie because in a world where a rat dragging a slice of pizza across a manhattan brownstone would get tens of millions maybe even hundreds of millions of views i would totally believe that a boy with a diaper on his hand would go viral that i get what What really surprised me about that scene was that no one else was really grossed out. They just kind of took out their smartphones and they even did that cliche thing of pointing at the kid and laughing, which wouldn't happen in real life. If anything, if I I believe that the diaper boy would go viral or the diaper hand would go viral, but I would also anticipate that the place would be shut down that this restaurant they were eating at for health code violations. But The movie's not even smart enough to come up with that. Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, is a big disappointment compared to the other three Wimpy Kid movies, which were much smarter and much funnier, and they get my rating of a flunk out. Admittedly, it's not Tom Everett Scott or Alicia Silverstone's fault that this movie's bad, but this movie just grossed you out and really not in a good, funny way. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Chuck. Chuck is no relation to the show that aired on NBC starring Zachary Levy about the secret agent who works at a Walmart-type store. It's actually about Chuck Wepner, the, the boxer who is most famous for going up against heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali in 1975, just about six months after Muhammad Ali defeated George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle in Zaire. But Chuck Wepner went up against Muhammad Ali. He was an amateur boxer before going up against Ali, hitting the big time. And while Chuck Wepner lost that match against Ali, he did last 15 rounds with the champ and was 19 seconds away from going the full 15 rounds before Muhammad Ali scored a TKO against him. So the movie touches a little bit upon that. And if it actually focused on the fight itself, the building up to the fight and the fact that Chuck Wepner lost, it would be a compelling movie, but you would also be quick to compare it to the movie Rocky, upon which Chuck Wepner's life was loosely based. Of course, there are some very notable differences between Chuck Wepner and the character of Rocky Balboa, but Sylvester Stallone was actually directly inspired by Chuck Wepner going up against Muhammad Ali and lasting as long as he did in the fight against Ali against the odds. I don't think Wepner was at all expected to win. He was definitely going in there as the underdog, but he did well with what he was given, and Chuck Wepner became somewhat of a folk hero, especially in his native Bayonne, New Jersey, for lasting as long as he did against Muhammad Ali. And the movie touches upon that as well. It also touches upon Chuck Wepner's going to see Rocky, learning that Rocky Balboa was inspired by him, and sort of riding the coattails of fame from there. However, the movie is tonally uneven, despite good performances by the likes of Leave, um, leave 
Schreiber, excuse me, who plays Chuck Wepner in this movie. There are also some g really good supporting performances by Elizabeth Moss, who plays Chuck Wepner's first wife, Phyllis, who has to deal with not only his fame, but also his drug and alcohol use, and, of course, his constant philandering, which he does even before becoming famous for fighting Muhammad Ali. There's also a bartender named Linda, played by Naomi Watts, who serves as Chuck Wepner's second love interest. There are, there are also some notable performances in this movie by the likes of Ron Perlman, who plays Chuck Wepner's wingman and also, well, personal trainer, Al Braverman. He, he has some good lines in this movie. There's Chuck Wepner's long-lost brother, John, played by Michael Rappaport. And there is his best friend, who's also named John, who's played in this movie with significant weight gain, or at least it looks that way, by Jim Gaffigan. So the movie deals with sort of the rise and fall of Chuck Wepner. After he rides out his fame with the original Rocky, he actually is brought on as a consultant for the sequel to Rocky after meeting Sylvester Stallone. And I gotta say one thing about this movie. This movie makes Sylvester Stallone look really good. He's played in this movie by an actor named Morgan Spector, who not only looks a lot like Sylvester Stallone in this movie, but he also sounds a lot like him. In fact, at, at first I thought they had hired a Sylvester Stallone impersonator. And if they did, they would have gotten their money's worth. But actually, the actor Morgan Spector has also appeared in movies such as Christine from last year, a movie which actually I didn't see, but I really want to. He was in the last Airbender movie, which if you haven't seen it, I don't blame you. That movie I heard was pretty bad. And he was also in Dennis Lehane's movie The Drop from three years ago. Another one that kind of flew under the radar despite the star power of Tom Hardy and James Gandolfini in the role. But anyway, so this movie touches upon Chuck Wepner's consultations with Rocky II and also his he came very, very close to making a cameo appearance in Rocky II, but because of the fact that he can't act and also the fact that he had issues with alcohol and cocaine, he didn't get the role. And so he never quite recovered from that blunder, even though Sylvester Stallone, according to this movie, wanted Chuck Wepner to appear in this film. So this movie probably would be a good cautionary tale for anybody who watches it, showing how instant fame can get to your head and also how substance abuse can affect even the best of us. But the movie never really gels or materializes. I wasn't really convinced by the love story that was going on between Lee Schreiber and N Naomi Watts. In fact, I thought Naomi Watts in this movie was somewhat forgettable. Obviously, she was in this movie and she looked really good, which is probably one of the big reasons why Chuck, Chuck Wepner in this film went after her. But there wasn't a lot of dimension to her character, which was really disappointing. If anything, Elizabeth Moss, best known for playing Peggy Olsen in Mad Men, uh, that show from years ago or a few years ago, probably stole a lot of the scenes in this film. She played the long-suffering wife of Chuck Wepner, and as I said previously, she has to deal with Chuck Wepner's philandering and drug use and the fact that, she, that he doesn't serve as a very good role model for their daughter. What you don't see, and what I really wanted to see, was Chuck Wepner actually working. His job was as a liquor salesman. And the only work you really see him do is go into bars. But you're not exactly sure if he's going in there to deliver liquor or if he's just going in there to drink. The movie never really shows that. It also doesn't show his life right now. You get sort of a glimpse of it in a very vague epilogue, but that's about it. So Chuck is well acted, but it gets a very low checkout for me. It doesn't get a strikeout because the acting is really good. Lee Schreiber is very, very good as Chuck Wepner. And as I said, Elizabeth Moss and the actor Morgan Spector 
are the standouts in this movie, but I really wanted more. If you want to get the full story about Chuck Wepner, I recommend seeing the 30 for 30 documentary on him on ESPN. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called The Wall. And before you ask, it is not Pink Floyd's The Wall. That movie is actually, its official title is Pink Floyd The Wall. No punctuation, Pink Floyd The Wall. The, this movie, The Wall, was actually made this year, and it only actually stars three people of note. Um, there's Aaron Taylor Johnson, who's the main character in this film, John Cena, and at least the voice of an actor named Laith Knackley. And the movie is, it takes place in 2007 in Iraq, and it details the trials and tribulations of two American soldiers who are trapped by a lethal sniper with only an unsteady wall between them. That description is somewhat misleading, but anyway, the wall takes place in 2007, and as I said, it takes place in Iraq, and it says in the original opening uh, prologue that it's 2007 and the war is winding down in Iraq. That is actually not true if you know your history of the Iraq War. Actually, in 2007, President, then President George W. Bush sent 500,000 more troops into Iraq because it was unstable. If this movie had just made that slight correction and said it was 2010, I'd probably believe this movie a lot more, especially since this movie probably more emphasized the fact that Iraq was still unstable and ultimately led to the rise of ISIS. But maybe that's a weightier topic for another time. But either way, so these two American soldiers are named Isaac and Matthews, which interestingly are names of <laughs> books in the Bible, but I don't think there's any biblical connection here. But anyway, the two of them are literally posted on a rock looking at barren land, barren except for a, an oil pipeline that's going across the land. So according to the dialogue from John Cena, the two of them have been stationed in their positions for 20 hours, which I don't find particularly realistic because you can only stay in a spot watching a, a piece of barren land for maybe eight hours at most. But I highly doubt 20 hours you'd be lying there. You'd, you'd have to eat. You'd have to use the bathroom. You'd have to sleep, for God's sake. But in any event, John Cena's character, Matthew, is getting bored, finally ventures onto the barren land where he actually gets shot by a sniper. So Aaron Taylor Johnson's character, Isaac, goes in after him and also finds himself getting shot by a sniper, and he hides behind this very rickety wall, which is held together by bricks that are probably not even laid down correctly. But either way, the, the wall is very rickety, and it's actually his only protection from this sniper, who actually communicates with him by way of shortwave radio. Now, the thing that makes this movie immediately unrealistic is I don't I don't refute the idea that a soldier would get bored, wander onto a barren land, and then get shot. I could understand that. What I don't understand from this movie is how a fellow soldier goes in after him without radioing for help first. It only occurs to him to radio for help when the second soldier gets shot by the gunman who he can't see and then hides behind the wall. So his radio is actually shot by the sniper. Not only is he shot, but his radio is shot as well. So he's not able to radio for help. So initially I would think that this kind of narrative of this so this vulnerable soldier hiding behind a wall with a sniper who kind of has his eye on him, I would think that would be a compelling, compelling narrative. Unfortunately, the movie never really gets its credible foothold after that because I have no war experience, let alone military experience. I've never enlisted or anything like that. But 
I've seen enough cop movies and military movies to know, especially a crucial scene in Full Metal Jacket, where if there's a sniper and he shoots and he or she shoots one person, you don't just go in and see, one person doesn't go in and see what the problem is. There's already a problem. There's a sniper. There may be more. You radio for backup. That seems to be logical. But it doesn't occur to Aaron Taylor Johnson's character in this film, and that just seems to me to be incredibly unrealistic. The narrative, or rather the exchange between Aaron Taylor Johnson's character, and Aaron Taylor Johnson is British, but here he plays not only an American, but a guy from the South, what state it doesn't really make clear, but either way, he's a dedicated soldier, and he's communicating with this Iraqi soldier named Juba, and, he's, and there's a certain cat and mouse game going on where he's trying to figure out where the sniper is, but he can't exactly figure out where that is. That's all well and good. But unfortunately, the climax of this movie is incredibly unrealistic, especially when you consider... I, I won't give it away what happens. I try not to give away any spoilers, but... One of the characters meets their demise, and it's in a very, very unrealistic way. And the movie, unfortunately, is sloppily edited, especially towards the end, to make this scene any more credible. I also, as I said, don't understand why the mentioning the Iraq war was winding down had any significance in this film. They could have just said, Iraq... 30 miles outside of Baghdad or whatever it is, 2007. Boom. That's all I need to know. But unfortunately, the wall falls short, despite some good acting from all three of the principal actors, Aaron Taylor Johnson, John Cena, and Laith Knockley. But it gets my rating of a strikeout. It's a movie that is well shot. It has some very good cinematography, but the editing is sloppy, and overall, the narrative loses its credibility in the first 15 minutes. And when it does that, it's unfortunately not able to recover. And this is from Doug Liman, who directed The Bourne Identity. He should have known better. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Dark Song. This is a movie you probably haven't heard of, let alone seen, but it is actually streaming now on Amazon Video. The way I saw it was actually at a midnight showing a couple of weeks ago. It's actually on my to-do list of films I need to review, my words on film waiting list, which you people on TV can actually see, but you radio people, I have to actually describe to you. But A Dark Song is an Irish film that, that marks the full length or, yeah, full length directorial debut of Liam Gavin, who is an Irish director and a newcomer at that. And the stars, this mainly stars two Irish actors, Susan Lothnan and Mark Huberman. And it's a movie about a determined young woman and a damaged occultist who risk their lives and souls to perform a dangerous ritual that will grant them what they want. And just to give you more of an emphasis about what they want, the character is played by Susan, Susan Lothnan, is named Victoria Howard, and she is a woman who lost her child. So, so she confines in this former occultist named Neil Hughes, played by Mark Huberman, to get her child back, if only for a moment. And there is a lot of witchcraft going on in this movie, although it's not especially scary. It's just very detailed, and it's also very dark, especially considering that Mark Huberman's character, Neil, is not a particularly nice person. As a matter of fact, there are times where it almost seems like he's a drill sergeant to the character of Victoria. They exchange a lot of heated words, and certainly they are in an abandoned house where there are certain rituals they have to follow, and there are times where Victoria wants to leave the house, but, but Neil tells her that he can't, and if, if they do, they'll be frozen in time. Not sure exactly how that works, and the logic of this witchcraft was kind of lost to me, but it might require a second viewing to get all of it. And I'm not even sure if this is legitimate witchcraft. I don't really have time to do that kind of research. 
or if it's something that the screenwriters made up. Or actually, the screenwriter, Liam Gavin, not only directed this movie, he also wrote it. But I do have to give this movie credit, even though the uh, occultist logic is, was a little lost to me at times, I do appreciate this movie for going as dark as it does and not being the kind of horror movie scare. It is... Uh, it can be considered a horror movie, but they're also, it's also a drama and a psychological suspense movie. So I think that if this movie was put in the Hollywood system, there would have to be a monster in it somewhere. Some studio executive sitting on his plush chair in Hollywood would, would make some dumb monster or some scary being here. And I appreciate the Dark Song for not insulting the intelligence of its audience. Unlike, by the way, a PG-rated movie, <laughs> Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, which I reviewed a couple of moments ago. But anyway, there is a lot going on here. It's, it actually has the structure of, I think, one of those plays you see at, a, at an independent theater where the movie doesn't exactly need any props. It could just use these two people but surprisingly this movie was not a, a play in a in a uh, in, in an independent theater with you know just two chairs i i'm trying to think of the the name of that kind of theater with with very limited props and very limited effects but i i think you guys can probably gather what kind of avant-garde play i'd be talking about so this movie isn't exactly avant-garde the two characters in the movie actually make some semblance of sense it's just when they deal with occult and witchcraft ideas where the movie gets a little confusing but still compelling enough and certainly dramatic enough to hold your attention depending on what time it is i will confess that when i saw this movie as a midnight movie i did fall asleep towards the end of it or at least in moments but it, it is a movie that, that may not be ex exactly suitable for the midnight crowd who probably wants something a little bit more stimulating. But I was intrigued by various parts of it. And I think that the relationship between Mark Huberman and Susan Lothnan in this film was the catalyst that brought this movie forward. What confused me was as I said, some of the logic, but there are certain scenes where the character of Victoria actually hears her son and her dead son and wants to go near him, but she's advised against doing so by Neil. It just didn't really make sense to me. If, if, he, if she wants to see her son again, why is she being advised against going near him? I know that's, that sometimes the, the, the plot of such classic stories as the, the monkey hand, where somebody makes a wish for their dead son to come back to life, and the suspense is, if he comes back to life, will he come back as his normal self before he died, or as his mangled self after he died, whereas he died in an accident. So there's that compelling plot or plot device but i just maybe should have probably paid a little bit more attention to the witchcraft ideas maybe if i watch this movie again on amazon video i might appreciate it a little bit more but as i said i do appreciate the fact that this movie goes probably about as dark as the movie antichrist but i i would say as dark but Antichrist is another movie that's incredibly unpleasant to watch. It is about two very messed up individuals and about the hallucinations that drive them mad. Kind of like this movie. And Antichrist is another movie I didn't love, but I appreciated it for being outside of the Hollywood system and not afraid to go dark. So... A Dark Song is a movie that gets my rating of a checkout. It is a slow burner. It's certainly not going to hold everyone's attentions. It may confuse a lot of people, as it did me. But I do appreciate its originality. I do appreciate its raw character development. 
and I enjoyed some aspects of it. And I'm glad you could join me. However, this is the last break I have, and I'm going to get into my final segment, which is what's coming out next. These are the movies that are probably going to make big waves this weekend, especially since it's Memorial Day weekend. So there are a number of movies that are coming out this Friday and are probably going to debut pretty well. In fact, I predict that the Baywatch movie is going to be number one at the box office next week. And so when I made that pred- while I make that prediction, I might as well tell you what it's about. This is actually the first theatrically released movie that is based on the hit 90s TV show. And some of the earlier actors from Baywatch might make an appearance in this movie, but I don't know that. I wouldn't be surprised to see David Hasselhoff make a cameo appearance in this film. But after all, he did make an, a cameo appearance in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I think Part 1 as well, but don't quote me on that. But this time, Baywatch is starring Dwayne Johnson, Zac Efron, and Priranka Chopra, amongst other people. So this is about devoted life- lifeguard Mitch Buchanan butting heads with a brash new recruit. Together, they uncover a local criminal plot that threatens the future of the Bay. So even though Baywatch was a long-running TV show and it actually held the world record for a while, I'm not sure if it's been broken, but in the 90s, it held the world record for being for airing in the most countries of any syndicated show in TV history. I'm pretty sure some other shows might have broken that record, but Baywatch definitely has a following. It might seem kind of corny and tacky now. I, I don't know. I've never seen a single episode. I just know it by reputation. But I will definitely see the Baywatch movie. It's From the looks of it, especially since Dwayne Johnson and Zac Efron are in the leading roles, it looks more like a parody of Baywatch and not a serious adaptation of such a TV show. But I don't think Baywatch even took itself seriously, so why should this movie? But I'm going to see it. I'll let you know what I think on next week's show. Another movie that's coming out this weekend of note is Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell... Excuse me. Dead Men Tell No Tales. So Captain Jack Sparrow is back and he's searching for the tri- for the Trident of Poseidon. Not sure exactly <clears throat> what that means, but either way, it is a plot device in the fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movie. So I, a lot of you who are listening to the show regularly probably know my rule about um, sequels. And that rule is... I don't normally see sequels unless I've seen the original movies first. The only Pirates of the Caribbean movie I've seen is the first one from 2003, Curse of the Black Pearl. I neglected to see the other three movies after that, but I will see this movie because I don't imagine that I've missed anything from the previous three Movies. I think the the plots of Pirates of the Caribbean are episodic enough so that I probably wouldn't get lost. But this fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movie indicates the return of Johnny Depp, Jeffrey Rush, and Orlando Bloom, at least a few of whom have been in most of the other Pirates of the Caribbean movies. I'm pretty sure that Johnny Depp has been in all five. But another new face in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell Tell No Tales, is Javier Bardem, who, judging from the movie poster, is probably playing the villain. So, can't tell whether this movie's good or bad or not. It's the fifth movie, so I the, the franchise might have overextended itself by now i can't really say for sure but i'll go into it non-judgmentally and i'll let you know exactly what i think next week another movie that's coming out this weekend is one that's coming out in limited release and it's called long strange trip this is a documentary about the grateful dead it's the basically the tale of the grateful dead in its entirety It says in the tagline that the tale of the Grateful Dead is inspiring, complicated, and downright messy. Messy, excuse me. A trial, excuse me, a tribe of contrarians. They made art out of open-ended chaos and inadvertently achieved success on their own terms. I can respect that, even though I don't especially care for their music. 
So this documentary shows never-before-seen footage and interviews that offer this unprecedented and varnished look at the life of the dead. I don't know if this is coming out in a theater near me. If it is, I'll probably go see it, and I'll let you know what I think next week. However, that just about wraps things up for Words on Film for this week. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, ladies and gentlemen. And just to remind you, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. You're either listening to this show on bostonfreeradio.com, watching it on a community radio station like Somerville Community Access TV, or Facebook Live. In any event, as always, I'll see you at the movies.